Hello and welcome back to Anthropology 201 World Cultures. This is part two of lecture series four. In this lecture, we are going to be discussing pastoralist societies. First, we will cover pastoralist economics, and then we will discuss the traits of pastoralist cultures, and the final topic of discussion in the lecture series will be to take the new air and examine the nine parts of culture. So first, pastoralism. Like horticulture, pastoralism first appeared in the Neolithic period. Pastoralism, also known as animal husbandry, is a subsistence pattern that involved herding, breeding, and using domesticated animals for food and other means. These animals include camels, cattle, goats, horses, llamas, reindeer, sheep, and yaks. Pastoralism is most frequently practiced in areas of the world where the terrain, soil, or rainfall is inadequate for agriculture, but provides sufficient vegetation for livestock to graze. Anthropologists differentiate between two types of movement patterns among pastoralists, transhumanists and nomadism. Transhumanist is the seasonal movement of livestock between upland and lowland pastures. In societies that practice this, there's often a base location where elders, women, and children reside. This is also where lacta lactating animals remain. The men travel around their territory with the non-lactating animals. Nomadism is the migration of the whole village when the animals need new pastures. The availability of water and pasturage, government restrictions, and the demands of other food getting strategies, such as cultivation, influence the cultural patterns of pastoralist people. Nomadic pastoralists take advantage of seasonal variations in their territory to maximize the food in their herd. For example, the Kazakhs of Eurasia keep their livestock at low elevations during the winter and move to the foothills in the spring and then the mountains in the summer. The general consensus among anthropologists is that pure pastoralist societies are either extremely rare or non-existent. Populations cannot meet all of the nutritional needs from livestock alone. So many pastoralists either combine the keeping of livestock with some other form of cultivation or maintain regular trade relations with neighboring agriculturalists. It is clear that in pastoralist societies, livestock play a vital economic role not only as a food source, but in other ways as well. Melville Horskovitz is an anthropologist who worked among the East African pastoralists, and he found that cattle served three purposes. First, cattle were an economic asset with a utilitarian purpose. From a cow, you get milk, blood, and meat for food. You get dung as fertilizer and building materials and fuel. The urine was used as an antiseptic. Their bones were used to make tools and artifacts. Their skin can be used to make clothing, shelter, rafts. And their strength provided a means of transportation and traction for farming. The second purpose was that cattle had a social function. 
they played a symbolic role and were important status symbols. Large herds conveyed status to families or enabled sons to secure a wife. And the third purpose was that farmers were attached to their cattle. Cattle were ver valued and adored. Among the new heir, young boys were named after their favorite animal in the family's herd. Now, a modern form of pastoralism is practiced by cattle and sheep ranchers in Western North America, Australia, New Zealand, Argentina, and a few other areas in the world. These ranchers, they do not identify themselves as subsistence pastoralists, but rather as businessmen who produce a commodity for national and international markets. Now, let's talk a bit more about pastoralist economies. Among pastoralists, the most critical resource is livestock and land. Access to grassland and water is gained through membership in kinship groups. Within pastoralist camps, all members share equal access to pastures. It is this right of access rather than ownership that is important. Animals require a substantial investment in labor. They must be tended, they must be fed, in some cases crowds or other structures must be built for them. When they are ill they must be cared for because if they are neglected they often die. Thus, all members of a pastoral community must have access to pasturage. The animals themselves, however, are typically owned by individual families. Now, animals are kept as wealth in their own right. The prosperity and often the status of family are determined by the number of animals they own. One result of this is that the animals are not often killed, and when they are killed, it's through some ceremony, ceremony or religious celebration. Instead, they live off animal products such as milk and blood. These products and the animals themselves are often traded for other goods that the pastoralist community cannot or does not produce. In most places, pastoral tribes are migratory. The yearly migrations of pastoral people often traverse the lands of agricultural people. In these cases, access to pasturage and migration routes are determined through negotiation with local authorities. Now, contemporary pastoralists often establish access to land by contracts with landowners of villages that they move through. For example, the yak herding Drakba of northwestern Tibet present an interesting historical example of pastoralism. The Drakba were under the control of large Buddhist monasteries that owned all of the grassland in the area. The families were granted the right to use pastures in return for tax payments. Now, this tax payment can come in the form of animal products, the animals themselves, or money. Now, the allocation of pasture land was reviewed every third year and altered to fit family herd size and composition. The system worked well because the land could be managed and even out the grazing. Now, there are certain traits that we can assume or derive from pastoralist economies based on their tendencies. First, they require extensive territory and access to water and pasturage for livestock, and must work out arrangements among themselves and with non-pastoralists to gain access to 
pasturage. Second, there is no individual control of pasturage as a general rule. And lastly, the allocation of land and resources depend on ecological variables, such as types of animals herded, size of population relative to the land, and the relationship of pastoralists to the larger society. Let's look at our Drakpa and Buddhist example. Contracts are reviewed every third year, and the pasturages are reallocated. They would look at each family, the size of their herd and the types of animals that they had, and allocate the pastures for them. You would not give the small family who only has one or two goats the largest pasture. You're going to give that to the family who has 30 head of yak, and you're going to give the smaller pastures to the families who have the smaller animals. So, let us take a look at the nine parts of culture and apply them with our new air culture. Now, the new air refer to themselves as Noth, which means the people, and are the second largest ethnic group in southern Sudan, numbering more than a million and living in an open savanna and swamps that line both sides of the Nile. The Nuer land, cycling seasonally as it does through a state of parched grass or soggy swamp, might appear to hold little value to an outsider. The New Air themselves, however, have a very different view. They think that they live in the finest country on earth. As herders, as herders, they indeed assess their land correctly. Their soil is made of thick clay, which cracks in the sun during droughts. These deep grooves are soaked and filled in the rainy season, cradling enough water to allow certain species of grasses to thrive even during the driest of seasons, providing excellent pasture for cattle. During times of intense flooding, sandy areas and somewhat higher elevations offer refuge. Rainfall and flooding from the rivers that cross their lands provide the new air with surface water and abundant grasses, which, at their peak, can reach shoulder height. However, the seasonal changes from wet to dry and back again are sudden and often cataclysmic. So soggy swampland is rendered dry and withered in a short time as the blazing sun quickly evaporates the surface water from the clay soil. This, coupled with insufficient rainfall, may result in a shortage of pasture land. And it is this cycle of flooding and drought that results in an environmental system that steers the direction of the new air, social, and economic life. So now, the nine parts of their culture. We got language, subsistence pattern, economy, social stratification, family and kinship patterns, technology, political organization, settlement patterns, and ideology. So first, language. The New Heirs speak an Eastern Sudanic language of the Nilo-Saharan language family. The New Air language is similar to that of the neighboring Dinka and Atwat. The New Air refer to themselves not as New Air, but as Noth. The importance of cattle to New Air life can be seen in the fact that men and women both take the names of their favorite oxen or cows, and often prefer to be greeted by their cattle names. Next, subsistence pattern. Their stable crop is millet 
consumed in the form of porridge and beer, and they supplement this with a small amount of maize and even lesser quantity of beans. Some tobacco is encouraged to grow under the eaves of their huts, and gourds can send their vines up along the fences of cattle corrals. One of the richest agricultural areas is along the banks of the Baro River, which marks the border between Ethiopia and Sudan. However, there is a lot of conflict over this border because of the ability to grow crops even during the dry seasons. Now, millet's hardiness is such that the new air can reap two harvests per year, but even so, it will not survive too much standing water, and thus, gardens have to be established on high ground. Even the elevation is such from water gardens may be lost due to running down the slopes, so small dams are often constructed as a solution. Now, those foodstuffs provided by their cattle, meat and milk products, must be supplemented by fish and grain. Millet is best sown inland, and the rivers where the fish are abundant are far away from these inland sites. The new air practice neither crop rotation nor fallowing, and neither fertilize nor irrigate. Instead, they move on to another site when the land is depleted. Although new air territory is rich in game, hunting is not as a strategy relied upon. They rarely set out to hunt, pursuing only those gazelle and giraffe who present themselves at the camps. Their herds provide them with meat enough to suit them. However, Lions may be killed to protect cattle, and the same can be said for leopards, whose skins are highly valued by the new air. Next is economy. Traditional new air economy is a mixture of pastoralism and horticulture. Such a mixed economy is dictated by their environment, because neither strategy alone would be sufficient to provide for their needs or those of their cattle. Of the two strategies, pastoralism is the one favored both by the environment and the new air themselves. Next is social stratification. The new air are organized as a number of autonomous communities. Great importance is placed on patrilineal lineage. Groups of lineages are organized into clans who have slightly prevailing statuses within their specific territory. The less privileged might include members of other clans or those of the Dinka descent. Within a community, men are divided into six age sets. The new air are perhaps best known as the most often cited example of the segmentary lineage organization. Marshall Shalins, in his classic study of this type of system, describes it as the inevitable result of tribal growth. The principle of segmentary lineage organization is that although lineages may be distinct and opposed to one another at one level, those same lineages may be affiliated with one another and opposed to another lineage at a different level of segmentation. Next up is family and kinship patterns. Among the new heir, there are roughly 20 patrilineal clans. Each of these can be divided into maximal lineages, which can in turn be divided into 
major lineages. These are segmented into minor lineages, which are divided into minimal lineages. A minimal lineage recons its descent from one great grandfather. It is these most minimal groups around which New Air daily life revolves. There is neither leadership nor formal organization in the higher levels. There are potential connections waiting to be achieved should the need arise. Now, in a dispute between different minimal lineages, allegiances can be formed by drawing from people related to, you know, a higher level. Now, each side of the conflict can mobilize more and more kin by reaching out to more and more distant kin. Next up is technology. New Air technology is simple in manufacture and sophisticated in suitability to the local environment. Traditionally, the New Air have typical tools and standard primitive weapons. The New Air were superior warriors in their region and often carried bow, a club, and a large lance or spear. The New Air have a very simple technology. Their country lacks iron and stone, and the number and variety of trees are small and they are generally unsuited for constructive purposes other than buildings. Next up is the political organization. The New Air have no centralized political leadership. Theirs is a kin-based society, and it is only through an understanding of the kinship organization that one can apprehend the way of life in which their social system functions. Evans Pritchard found the New Air to be deeply democratic people, with an egalitarian approach to their communal life. It is the obligation of kin to help one another. When one household has a surplus, it is shared with its neighbors. Amassing wealth is not an aim of the New Air. Although, a man who owns a large herd of cattle may be envied. His possessions of numerous animals does not garner him any special privilege or achievement. The next part of culture that we're going to look at is settlement patterns. The New Air are forced to build villages for protection against the flooding rains and mosquitoes, and to practice horticulture. They are driven out of these villages into migratory camps to escape the droughts and to fish. Most villages are built on elevated mounds above the flood line and mosquito breeding in the standing water. Now these mounds will stretch for a mile or two in length. Open ground is preferred to wooded areas, as it provides better protection to the cattle from insects and predators in the woodlands, and because millet fares better in an open environment. The construction is of wood, and termites are generally better avoided in open stretches of ground. A typical New Air homestead consists of a hut and a cattle barn. Families move from one section of the village to another, especially if there have been any quarrels or the pastures have been exhausted. Huts and barns last about five years before they need to be rebuilt. And after a decade or so, the gardens and pastures are no longer usable and the entire village community may seek out a new site. Camps, the new air settlements in the dry season, consist of flimsier structures. 
built close to the water sources and oriented so that their backs are to the wind and their fronts face the cattle. These shelters can be erected in a few hours using grass material pastured with or plastered with dung. The last part of culture we are going to discuss is the New Air ideology. The religion of the New Air is predominantly one of monotheistic animism. Efforts by Christian missionaries have converted a very small segment of the New Air people to Christianity, but most practice the traditional religion. The New Air speak of Quoth as the creator, as a father and judge, as a guiding force and recipient of their prayers. Evans Pritchard suggested that this overarching concept could be roughly analogized to the Western notion of God. However, there are also two other categories of supernatural beings that figure prominently in New Air religions. Now, these are the spirits of the above and the spirits of the below. One of the ways in which these spirits differ from the rather larger concept of Quoth is that different individuals accord various spirits of the above and below varying interest and respect. A certain spirit may be significant for some individuals and families, but not for others, whereas Quoth is recognized and revered similarly by all New Air. So first, the spirits of the above. Whether a person feels distinctly connected to any of the spirits ordinarily has to do with whether or not the individual or any family member has had direct contact with the spirit, usually in the form of possession. Sudden illness may be seen as possession, and once recovered, the sufferer may come to regard the spirit that has sent the illness as one of his or her own kuth, which is a term applied to all spirits. Temporary spirit possession can be remedied by sacrifice. An animal is dedicated to the offending spirit, and the recovery is expected to follow. There are instances, however, of spirit possession that are permanent. That person is then Guan Koth, the owner of that spirit. They are hollowed out by the possession and filled up with the gifts bestowed by that spirit. Such an individual's character is forever altered. In this new role, the prophet, usually male, is relied upon for certain ritual functions. One of the spirit of the above is the Colwick, who were once New Air themselves. Individuals who have been struck by lightning, killed in windstorms, or found dead in the bush unaccountably are thought to have undergone a metamorphosis and emerged divine. Now, death by lightning is not uncommon here, and violent electrical storms are cause for great anxiety. However, such a death is not thought to be retribution for any misconduct on the part of the deceased, as some deaths are regarded. Rather, the electrocuted person is seen to have been chosen by Quoth to be changed into a Colwick. Now, most lineages can cite at least one Colwick patron spirit. So next up is the spirits of the below. Spirits of the above are also known as the spirits of the air. They are great spirits and much revered. Now, spirits of the below, however, are regarded quite differently. They are believed to have fallen from above 
and as spirits of the earth, they are little spirits, and not held in the same reverence. Spirits of the below can be classified into several categories, the most important of which is that of totemic spirits. These attach to specific clans and lineages, and are usually described in animal form. Lion, lizard, crocodile, various birds and snakes, and of that such. The last thing we're going to talk about with New Air Ideology is the spirits as social refraction. It is evident that the spiritual conceptualizations of the New Air are intricately bound up in their social order. Spirits who belong to one lineage do not visit individuals of another lineage. Those that are represented by totems can act only for the clans whose totems they rightfully are. However, there are larger spiritual representations that do indeed bring to all new air, and in this way their religious structure resembles their social structure. Okay, so this concludes Lecture Series 4, Part 2, and our discussion of pastoralism societies. Now, Be sure to read the chapters covering the Baser and the Kurds in our Cultural Sketches book. And as always, let's all try and make better mistakes tomorrow. <laughs>